Hello, beloved. On this day, Thursday, the 14th of September, we are getting ready for our 10-day fast, our 10 days of awe. We're going to fast tomorrow, the 15th from sundown, for Rosh Hashanah, a time of repentance, and we're going to fast those 10 days, the 10 days of awe, until Yom Kippur, which will begin Sunday, September the 24th, and end Monday after the sun goes down. So our fast will end Monday the 25th after the sun goes down, or early the 26th for breakfast. I don't want to encourage you to jump on with us on this fast if you're not already on a fast. And let's fast corporately. I was just speaking to one of the pastors here and he said, is it just me or have you ever seen such wickedness, such wickedness around, such intense wickedness around us? And I'm telling you, at this time, beloved, we do not need to be caught not knowing what to do. We do not need to be caught in a position of weakness and don't know how to operate in weakness by casting ourselves on the Lord. So this time of fasting is specific. Specifically to kill our flesh. Specifically for repentance. One article called it Firm Israel. The article called it this time God's alarm clock. Because the sound of the trumpet, it begins with the blowing of the shofar tomorrow evening. As Rosh Hashanah begins, and then it ends with Yom Kippur, which is called the Day of Atonement, which is the highest holy day. And we, as Christians, who are grafted into the root of Israel, we need to be on this journey with them. They celebrate their new year beginning tomorrow. And we need a reset. Especially in America, we need a reset. We need a reset. We need a political reset. We need an educational reset. We need a financial reset. We need a spiritual reset. We need a reset. And so this 10 days of fasting... It must be food. It could be one meal. It could be fasting meats and just doing the Daniel fast with no desserts, no meat, just vegetables and fruit, no breads, or some part of the day you fast food. And when you're hungry, you must Turn to God. It's a time of turning inward. It's not a time for outer perspective. It's a time for introspection. It's a time to look on the inside. It's a time to ask our, ourselves, to examine ourselves. Are we in the faith? Or are we on our way to being reprobate? Are we on our way to being one of those who are we going to be in the number of apostasy falling away from the Lord? There's so many who have turned away from Christianity. And the saddest thing is, Christ is the only way back to God. Christ is the only way 
There is no other way. This is God's way that he made before the foundations of the earth. There is no other way. There are no two roads or several roads to heaven. There is only one way, Jesus Christ. So this 10 days of awe, beginning with the new year, Rosh Hashanah, the 16th of September, beginning from sundown, the 15th of September, leading up to the Day of Atonement, Yom, Yom Kippur, September the 24th at sundown, and Monday, so there, there are two Sabbaths in there. There's the first Sabbath, when God said there should be no no work for those who don't have to work it's a day to fast and pray and then in the end of the day you can celebrate and then go back on the fast the next day 10 days of all we need a reset amen it's a time of reflection a time of repentance. Replace food with Bible study. When you're hungry, turn to God. When I'm hungry, and I've been hungry because I've started my fast. And so I say to God, God, I am so hungry. So I'm asking you, kill my flesh. I'm asking you for discernment. I'm asking you for your wisdom. And then there's several questions that I need answers to that I'm asking him. It's not a time to move God's hand. We think we can manipulate God. We can't. We grow up in atmospheres and environments where we manipulate. And we think we can do the same to God the Almighty. It's not a time to get his attention. It's time for our attention to be toward him. Put those idols down. So many of us are serving idols. And we don't understand. They're opening up portals for the enemy to come in and harass our family. And their goal is to kill, steal destroy the enemy cannot help it he's the devil evil there's no good in him amen there's the time to resist temptation get a journal date and as you journey study the scriptures a good one to begin with is some sorry isaiah 58 isaiah 58 Get a journal, date it, write the scripture down, write what God is saying to you from those scriptures. The first couple of days may be one of trying to press in, don't give up, press in and come to the end. We are not praying. And nothing can be accomplished without prayer. Jesus told his disciples in that night when he was in the garden, that final night. He says, watch and pray. Watch and pray that you may escape temptation. He said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And that's where our problem is. Our problem as Christians is not the devil. Our problem as Christians is our flesh, our soulish mind, our thoughts and our desires. So we kill the flesh. Today I want to continue part two. I started last Thursday of pulling down every stronghold by the blood of Jesus. You know, Hosea 
4, 6, and I used this scripture last week. He says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. But they didn't just lack knowledge. They refuse knowledge. They reject knowledge. I was watching something that popped up on my YouTube feed last night. And they were showing this man. He's part of a, I didn't know they had a, organization for atheists and agnostics I didn't know that but there's an organization and so he was you know mocking God and and telling the people I'm not afraid of hell he's rejecting knowledge and the sad part of it Hosea 4 6 says because you've rejected knowledge, I will reject you. This is what God said. But not only will he reject the person who rejects knowledge, and this is the knowledge of the truth of God, but he said, I will also forget your children. And this is why we have a generation of desolation People who reject the Lord back to the third and fourth generation. And they've developed this environment of wickedness. This environment of darkness where the enemy hides and strikes. Constantly striking. And so this time, it's time for us to begin to hear the sound of the alarm. I put so many alarms on my phone. When I'm in the classroom, I've got a five-minute countdown for the kids to know you've got five minutes to get ready, do our call to order, and leave class. And then after lunch, I've got a five-minute countdown to tell me the next class is coming. It's an alarm. And it gets me ready. And it gets the kids ready. And so this season, let this message, and not only mine, mine is not even that eloquent. Mine is not even that knowledgeable. There's so many out there, and I'm so proud of my brothers and sisters who can teach you this. But the Lord told me, I can't wait until I'm perfect to do my part. And so I'm sounding the alarm. Do not reject the knowledge of God. Do not reject truth. Do not be so caught up in fleshy pursuits, in worldly pursuits, that you miss the timing of God, that you miss the visitation of God. Don't be asleep like the ten to five unwise virgins. There's a scripture this morning that came to me as I was doing my prayer that I thought went well with this passage, with this message. Matthew twenty two twenty nine. Jesus was discoursing with the people, but something he said applies not only for what he was talking about, which was marriage, but it applies for every area. He says in Matthew twenty two twenty nine, you do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. You are in error because not only do you not know the scriptures, but you also do not know God's power, God's power available to us. And I want to tell you, beloved, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And we've got to start living like we know that and believe that. Because the enemy is playing for keeps. 
Galatians 5, 16 says, This I say, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusted against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you are led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. In other words, when we turn our attention to the Spirit, and we need to do this, God taught the Jews that the next day really begins at sundown. That's when they start preparing for the next day. So when you get into your bed to go to sleep and you're watching all sorts of stuff that open demonic portals, then you set yourself up for that time when you close your eyes and when you're quiet, when the Lord can speak into your spirit because you're humble, you set yourself up instead for the enemy to speak. And I'm talking to me too. I have to be careful. So we need to turn our faces, our attention to the Lord at the beginning to prepare for the next day. So he can speak to us in our dreams like he did to, Mo, to um, Solomon. We need to turn to the Spirit, and fasting helps our flesh to come under submission. It brings a lot of things up to the surface that you didn't know that you are still working on. I realized how much I depend on food, not just for sustenance, but as a go-to for comfort. So instead of turning to the Lord for comfort, you find yourself turning to food. Because food doesn't complain. Food doesn't answer you back. Food doesn't criticize. But you pay the penalty in many ways. High cholesterol, bad blood pressure, blood sugar. You pay the penalty. You don't look good in your clothes. You, you're still... Your, so, we've got to learn how to walk in the Spirit. And we hate the word that goes with it, disciple. That's where discipline comes from. And that's one of the reasons why I set so many alarms. Because if I don't set alarms, then I don't remember that I need to do this, this, this. I get caught up and focused on something else. And again, this is an alarm time. Going back to Galatians 5, verse 19. It says, The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And listen to the list. The works of the flesh manifest as adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, not me saying it, the word of God saying that, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Why is it that people who call themselves Christians think that they can live like this and still end up in heaven? They can live like this and still get God's best. 
Notice, one of the manifestations of the flesh is witchcraft. And there's so much of it now in the church. Manifestations of the flesh. Samuel likened rebellion to the sin of witchcraft. And the opposite of all these fleshy things are the fruit of the Spirit. And that's one of the things you ask the Holy Spirit, you ask the Lord to help to grow up in you. It's in you. If the Holy Spirit is in you, and the Holy Spirit is in you if you are born again, unless you are reprobate. And that's why you need to examine yourself. The opposite of these fleshy things are the nine fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, suff long-suffering. And long-suffering is patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. Self-control. Against such there is no law. So these are the opposite of the flesh. And what we need, and this is what I'm asking the Holy Spirit, let the fruit grow and be nourished and strengthened in me. That I default, even in my dreams, even in my dreams. I'm not doing things in my dreams that are unholy, but I'm defaulting. I'm saying no. I'm taking authority in my dreams. Because I'm defaulting, that's what I'm asking him. That during this fast, my flesh will be killed. And the spiritual works will so arise in me. That even in my dream, I default to Christ. That when something happens in my classroom, that's considered horrendous, that I'll default to Christ. So today we're talking about pulling down every stronghold through the blood. I want us to note something. The Old Testament shows us a pattern, a shadow of things to come and one of the things that I'm talking about I want you to notice it in Genesis 12 chapter 1 Genesis 12 chapter 1 now the Lord said unto Abram get thee out of your country from your family from your father's house unto a land that I will show you. And you might say, well, what does that have to do with anything? It has a lot to do with everything. Listen really good because I want to build a foundation and take you somewhere. The Lord told Abraham to leave his family. Why would God do that? Let's get a glimpse at Joshua 24 2. Joshua 24 2, Joshua said to the people, Thus said the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time. Think of those generations. The desolation of generations. Think of back to the third and fourth generation. They dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time. Even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. Listen, you want to know why I'm talking about Abraham and God telling him to leave his father. Terah and his grandfather 
that's back to the second and the third generation. They served other gods. Let me tell you what Terra means. Terra means station. Terra means delay. A station of Israel in the wilderness. So, Terra means station or delay. And Terra and his father served other gods. So why did God tell Abraham, get out? To get him away from all those idols. To get him away from all the strongholds, from all the portals that were open. I want to make a I want to make a sidetrack and tell you this. I think I may have mentioned this last week. Witches are our enemy. But they're just being used. They're just being used by the demonic because they open themselves or somebody open them up to the demonic. You see, these demons cannot exist in our territory. They cannot legally exist in earth without an earth suit. That's why God left heaven a spirit. God is a spirit. And that's why he left heaven and clothed himself in flesh like one of us. Because to enter this world, you have to enter legally. And so these spirits need bodies to enter the world to enter this world and bodies to function through their functioning, but they're using the bodies. So some of these people, they think they are guiding these spirits. They think that some of they are in control, but they are not. The spirits are in control. The spirits are using their bodies. And when the spirits are through with them, they'll just chuck them, dump them, encourage them to commit suicide. Or whatever evil, because remember, the devil is evil. His demonic posse are evil. So when we see a witch, yes, it's it's an enemy. But Christ died for that human being. And so the best gift we can give Christ is to pray for that human that the demons leave them and they come to Christ. Christ deserved that worship. He gave everything. He deserved all worship. The devil deserves nothing. He didn't shed a tear for us. He didn't give one piece of hair for us. But God gave his everything for us. So that witch, that murderer, that rapist, they're being used by the demons. And that's why Jesus changed, transformed the law at the other side of the cross. And he says, pray for your enemy and for those who despitefully use you. Psalm 24, 1 tells us, all people are gods. All. And the blood of Jesus can reach the sin-sickest soul. And that's why he says in Matthew 5, 44, love your enemies. Pray for those who despitefully use you. Do you welcome them in your house? Do you open yourself to them? No, you don't. But you remember, they're being used by demons. 
And we as Christians, our job is to make sure we bring deliverance. That's our job. And part of our deliverance is praying for the sin sick. So don't cast them off and pray prayers like God kill them. Don't ask God to kill the witch and that witch dies and goes to hell and then get a chance for the blood to reach. The blood can reach the sickest, sin sickest soul. Amen. Matthew 5:44 says, "But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them who despitefully use you and persecute you." In the Old Testament, you had to kill them because there was no blood to save them but when Christ came this law was transformed through the cross so instead of killing them now the blood can save them amen our fight is not against listen our fight is not against flesh and blood and that's why we're losing it because we're busy fighting the witches and the devil is laughing his head off because he knows what he's doing. Our fight is not against flesh and blood. Ephesians 6, 12. Let's turn to Ephesians 6, 12. For our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Satan is organized. He's got hierarchies. He's got principalities over countries, over large cities that rule and that's why if you go to certain places like Chicago, they call it the murder capital. There's a principality of murder over there. And then there's New York, the abortion capital. There's a principality of abortion over there. And then under those principalities, you've got powers that are over maybe cities, smaller areas. And then you've got the individual demons that go out to individuals, go out to churches, but they're principalities. And that's why you can get off the airplane into a certain area and you can suddenly feel like you're choking or you can suddenly feel sick. Or you can suddenly feel energized. It depends on what principality is allowed to rule that area. So we're not fighting the people. And we cannot fight a spiritual warfare with carnal weapons, with arguing, with calling the police, with a gun. You can shoot the person and kill them. And that demon is not going to die. That's not how you kill that demon with a gun. The best revenge against the enemy is freeing that person for God. When you free a person from the enemy's hand, you're diminishing his power. The enemy's power is only as strong as the people, the people with flesh and blood that he can use. So destroy the enemy who's using the people. Pray the people be released from Satan's blindness long enough to repent and turn to Jesus. They're blinded, Jesus says, by the God of this world, who
who's blinded their minds. For instance, Beyonce, she's blatantly serving the altar of Satan. Blatantly, it's no secret. You don't follow her. You do not follow her. Every time you follow her, you partake of her altars. You partake of her altars or the altars of any demonic person. But you pray for her. She's not beyond redemption, we don't know. That's not for us to judge. But we don't follow her. Jude said in Jude 21, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, and of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by flesh. Do you hate your garment spotted by flesh? Do you know if your garment is spotted by flesh, you will not rise in the rapture? Because Christ is coming for a spotless church? Do you know you spot your garment by partaking of an evil altar? Smoking marijuana masturbating you partaking of evil altars you do not follow or even get close enough it's like electricity flowing you don't get close enough to get yourself pulled into it you do what you can to save the person but you don't use something like would cause the electricity to transfer from them to you. This transference of spirits. I was I was listening to Sean Boats and he told this story of meeting with the brother-in-law of an evil leader. Of course, he can't say who the leader is, and he can't say who the brother-in-law is, but it's a true story. He knew the brother-in-law, and the brother-in-law came and asked him, could you please come and speak to my brother-in-law? And so they flew him in secretly and took him to this secret place. Can God trust you with such an assignment? He said before he went, because he knew who this person was before he went. And he knew the evil this person had done to his fellow countrymen. He knew, but he had to get to the place where his flesh had to die, where he could see the human that Christ died for, and the opportunity, think of this, an opportunity to speak to a leader where a principality rules over that will cause that leader to so change that he ends up changing the entire country for Christ. We have to look at that. We can't say, oh, he's evil, so I'm not going to talk to him. That's stupid. Because now, a whole slew of people are under this evil rule and may not get a chance to see Christ. But if you have the opportunity to speak to this leader and see him give his heart to the Lord, then a whole city, a whole country, can be changed and that's a domino effect for other countries I need my flesh to die so I could be one that God can trust so he went in 
And he said he went into this place and he had to trust the Father into this secretive place. And he said he, he ex had an exchange with this man and had an opportunity to pray with him. Who can God trust to lead somebody as influential as Beyonce? Beyonce is influential around the world, like Michael Jackson was. Who can God entrust to go in and speak to her? To see change. I was listening to something last. It's funny how God pops these things up when it's time for me to speak about this. This is what I, because this message was prepared last week. But last night, I was listening to, I can't remember the station, is when these um, bunch of guys, and there's a gal in there too, and they're just shooting the breeze. And so they were talking about Beyonce, and there was one of them said she had interviews by Christians back in the day, but she said those Christians were harsh on her. He remembered those Christians looking at those interviews. See, sometimes we think that by being arrogant. We don't know. There, there are ways, there are times when we have to be. There are times when we have to be. But there are times when we don't. So who knows what it's going to take to shift her. Only God does. We cannot shift, get a chance to be used by God to shift his people without a heart of love for God. And love for his people that are created in his image, no matter how rotten they are. So be careful of being arrogant and ignorant. And let me tell you, being harsh, sometimes you have to be. And I heard, and on the same show last night, I heard her say it. And they, they played the tape again. Tiffany Montgomery was saying she was criticized harshly for mentioning about Beyonce but she wasn't talking to the people out there she was talking to the people on her stream who are part of her ministry and she was telling them shame on them to pray for money and then take the money you pray for and go to Beyonce's concert and support the person who despises God that's what she shows if you're going to use the Bible as a tampon that's despicable and she said they came against her the Christians came against her but she said I'm speaking to these people that I'm supposed to be covering and if I'm covering them I have to tell them the truth and she was saying you want me to say there's a fire in the middle of the night, and I have to say, hello, hello, there's a fire. Because you don't want to wake the neighbors up. No, you said, fire, fire. you're going to shout fire to save some people. Some got to wake up, but many are going to be saved. The same with a little child out in the middle of the street. You don't say, little child, come back, come on, no. You get out there and you snatch that child up and you give them what for to save their life. That's not being arrogant. That's not being ignorant. That's not being harsh. That's being wise. So we got to be careful what we call harsh. And it all comes down to being able to walk in the spirit being able to discern and that's why I'm fasting to kill my flesh so I can discern where the witches are at work so I can block 
their work against my family. And I can also pray for them. Spirits, listen, spirits need bodies. They need a point of entrance. And there's a lot of ways that become points of entrance. For instance, hate, bitterness, lack of love, unforgiveness, an unrepentant heart. It's like trash in the garbage that these flies can gravitate to and lay their maggot eggs. That's how the demons work. They have to have their character to latch on to. And that's why I always bring this scripture up because I love it. And it comes to me now. John 14, 30, Jesus says, I'm not going to say much more because the prince of this world comes and he has nothing on me. Does the enemy have anything in you, on you, that he can latch on to? Time to fast. Time to pray. Time to pray. Pray the word of God. Our weapons are mighty. Our weapons are not carnal. But they are mighty through God to the pulling down of these strongholds. And I'm telling you, I don't know if you're seeing it, but these strongholds are creating havoc. Suicide amongst our children is on the rise. 2 Corinthians 10.3 For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. We're walking in this fleshy body, but we will make a mistake to think that we're fighting people. And that's what the devil loves. Because while we're fighting each other, he can do his work in the darkness, undercover. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. To the pulling down of strongholds. Strongholds in Greek. And I love it. It's only used once, this word. Ahurama, Ahruama, and it's a castle, a fortress, anything on which one relies to make arguments and reasonings to dispute and defend himself against his opponent, strongholds, and that's what the Bible says, cast down, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, Cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Bring those thoughts. That's where it starts. It starts in the mind. Jeremiah chapter 1. I, I didn't plan that one, but I'm going to it. In Jeremiah chapter 1, God told Jeremiah, and I'm telling you the same now, God told Jeremiah in, in verse 10, Jeremiah 1, 10, see, I have set this day over the nations, I've set, I've set this day, you, over the nations and over the kingdoms, to do what? To root out. To pull down. To destroy. To throw down. And then when you're done, build and plant. And that's what we need in this hour. That's what we need in this hour. We need to root out. You know, it's like, when my auntie in her yard they would weed that yard and sometimes you would lift a rock up and all these things will crawl out you root out think of 
a tree, the roots dry very deep. You can cut that tree down all you want. A couple of years later, it's back again. If you want to get rid of it, you have to root it out. So we're talking about the third and the fourth generation. God said in Exodus 34, 7, he keep mercy for thousands. That's the kind of God he is. But even though he forgives the iniquity and transgression and sin, he will not clear the wicked. He will in no means clear the wicked. And he says he visits the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. And so back of us, we've got parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents. We don't need to go further back. But if they haven't lived the life, that pleases God. Until today, we still have Christians, Christians who pray and yet fornicating. You open portals, that's what the enemy likes. He latches on to it. Deuteronomy Chapter 28, verse 1 to 14 shows all the blessings, and I read that the last time. But Deuteronomy 28, verse 15, all the way to 68, shows all the bad things that will happen to those who ignorantly and deliberately refuse knowledge, turn their backs on God. And God said it will come to pass that if you will not listen to the voice of the Lord, and listen is not just with the air, but it's with obedience, to observe, to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I commend you this day, that these curses will come upon you. The Bible says the curse causeless cannot stand. Are you covered by the blood? And are you living a life that shows you are covered by the blood? Or are you living a life for Satan? He's using you. He's using you in gossip. He's using you in hate. He's using you in rebellion. He's using you in lying. Oh my gosh, it seems that's a, at an all-time high Christians lying. That doesn't go together. The Bible says in John 8, 44. John 8, 44. The devil is a murderer. He's a liar. He's been that way from the beginning. There is no truth in him. When he speaks a word, it's a lie. It says he's the father of lies, John 8, 44. So if you're up to telling lies, then I'm sorry. You're becoming a part of the devil's kingdom. And that's what you've got to understand. He did not come to earth to be mistreated so cruelly for us to just do what we want. He says, you do err, because you don't know the scriptures, Matthew twenty two twenty nine. 29, nor the power of God, the scriptures and the power of God in us through the Holy Spirit is what causes us to turn away. He didn't give it to us to just, well, I'm going to try. No, you don't have to try. You just have to submit, surrender to the Holy Spirit. As we come down, I've got a lot more to say. Isaiah 60, 61, 4 
says they shall build the old ways. They shall raise up the former desolation. That's back to the third and fourth generation of those who, even though they may have gone to church, they're still living in secretive sin. They're doing drugs. They're lying. They're cheating. They're committing adultery. They shall raise up. This is time to raise up. The former desolation. This is time to repair the waste cities. This is time for us to see the desolation of many generations come to life by the blood of Christ. We're running out of time to do it. Back to the third and fourth generation, a culture of sin was developed. And this culture of sin causes a cry for vengeance and it creates unholy altars and open portals for satanic penetration. Let me give you an example. I, I think I use this example last week but I'm going to mention it again because it, it, it's something that's too common all too common a man and a woman gets married have children everything seems to be going well and then the woman steps out on the man she steps out but now she commits adultery, but she goes with another woman's husband. And so that man decides, I don't love my wife anymore. I don't love you anymore. I don't need you anymore. I don't want you anymore. So he leaves that home. No, when he leaves that home, and this is so common, it's ridiculous. When he leaves that home, he leaves those children bereft. Not only emotionally, he leaves them a wreck. But now they're crying. They're angry. What happens as a result of their anger? What happens as a result of their bitterness that nobody comes in to deal with? Something the enemy can latch on to. Those children are little. They can't reason. Like some of us adults can't even reason well. Much as those little children, the enemy comes in and whispers, they don't love you. The enemy comes in and whispers, it's because you're ugly. It's because you didn't wash the dishes yesterday that your daddy left. It's because you won't stop misbehaving in school that your daddy left. It's because he wished that you were a boy that your daddy left. And all these lies the enemy brings to this young, impressionable mind. And they don't know how to reason and deal with it. They receive it as truth. And that's what the enemy wants. Now they're bitter. They begin to hide themselves under black makeup. They begin to hide themselves on the promiscuity. They begin to hide themselves on the harshness, meanness. They begin to be vessels for the enemy to use. And how about the wife that's left? How about the husband that's left on the other side? They're bitter. They're crying out. The enemy's hearing. He's coming, and he's whispering to them, they deserve to die. They deserve nothing. They're not going to get anything from me. And all these lies are coming. And if you think I'm telling a lie, you are the liar, because you know this is true. This happens every day, everywhere, 
too often and it's time these strongholds are pulled down. It's time it's pulled down. Because as a Christian, your husband walks out. Yes, you're angry. Yes, you're upset. But you're supposed to keep your heart free of bitterness. Because you know that the enemy can come in and latch on to it. So you're constantly turning it over to God. You're constantly crying out to God. You're refusing to go places where people will talk about the situation and bring in more anger, bring in more whatever. You're keeping yourself clear. And you're definitely not saying, God, kill that woman. God, make our children miserable. No, because you're saying, look how miserable my children is. Why would I want that to happen to those innocent children over there? But when you're not serving the Lord, you don't think that way. Even people who are serving the Lord are not thinking like him. Remember, I, I told you at the beginning, Galatians 5, 22, the character of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, gentleness, it's kindness, it's meekness, it's self-control. That's your character. It comes out in your prayer you refuse to be bound by the devil. You're saying to God, God, it hurts. It hurts like I don't know what. But I refuse to be bitter. I refuse to allow anything to come between you and me. Because you're the only one that can help me right now. God, I refuse to curse this woman. I refuse to curse these children. I refuse to curse this man. I refuse to curse those children. Instead, I say, God, bless them. God, everything that you want, everything that you wish, you begin to pray. It takes understanding God's word. It takes walking in the spirit. To understand that you begin to portray the character of Christ. And you begin to speak those words. And as you speak the words, you're planting seeds that are going to come up for you. The best revenge, remember, the best revenge that you can get on the enemy is for those people to be saved. And serve your God. If you claim you love God, wouldn't you want gifts for your God that you love? Well, the best gifts is for Beyonce to turn to God. The best gifts is for those adulterers to turn to God. The best gifts to God. That's the best revenge on the enemy. To cause these people. And that's why it says in Isaiah 61... One, and Jesus said in Luke 4, he said, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon you as a believer and upon me. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and empower you to make you witnesses for Christ. We're not doing our job. The church has not done. Now, they, remember, there's always a remnant. There's always that spotless bride. But on the whole, those who claim to be Christians, who claim to love the Lord, they have not done the job they should in teaching the truth, what this word says, what God himself says. And that's why we are in this, the place we're in God is not obligated to answer anything but his word. His angels, his angels. Psalm 103 verse 20 are only his ministers to answer, to hearken to his voice. So if out of our mouths are not coming his word, which he says in Isaiah 59, 21, which is a generation blessing that he put in our mouth. 
if that's not coming out of our mouth, we're not doing what he's commissioned us to do. It's time. Listen, I'm going to continue part three next week. It's time. It's time that we, as believers of God, who claim to love God, to kill this flesh. How? Through fasting and prayer again. Through meeting with like-minded people and meaning business with God. Mean business with God. Stop pleasing this flesh as if we're going to be living here forever. So many people died. Over a million people died in the last three years and left everything, everything that they built. They didn't take it with them. Some lived as if this is all the life they're going to live. They never prepared for the life that was to come. How many of you, how many of us have treasures in heaven that we could stand in front of the enemy and call on those treasures to come forth? Because we're too busy spending it on ourselves, pleasing ourselves. We got nothing. But remember the mercies of God. I'm going to end with that. Remember the mercies of God. It's new every day. Every day you can get up and start brand new. Until your eyes are closed in death, it's too late. Or until the trumpet sounds and the rapture happens, then it's almost too late. You still have a chance, but it's going to be a hard chance. If you can't survive now, I don't know how you're going to survive then when there's no Holy Spirit to help you. I don't know how you're going to survive then when the Antichrist takes over. And if you don't have his mark, you can't eat. How are you going to survive then if you have a hard time surviving now? If you have a hard time fasting now? I'm not talking to just you. I'm talking to me too. I'm not above you. I suffer the same things that you suffer. I suffer the same temptations you suffer. But I'm here to tell you, there's a God who cannot. It says, he is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Because he was in all points tempted, just like we are, yet without sin. And his power, his mercy is new every day to help us. And he says, no weapon formed against us. They'll be formed, but they cannot prosper. That's our heritage. That's our heritage. Amen? So I want to pronounce a blessing over you today. I want you to be aware that it's time for you to live a life of discipline and it's not what we think it is it's following Christ being his disciple by going into his word with his Holy Spirit who's ever willing to teach it's time we're running out of time I'm crying out every day for my family and friends because I don't want them to be left behind I don't want to be left behind the Bible says, let him who thinks he stand, be careful lest he fall. So I'm not standing here thinking, I'm all that on a piece of cake. Because who knows, if I don't turn my weaknesses over to Christ, the enemy can have a field day in my weaknesses and cause me to stumble. So I'm trying to live a life of repentance. I'm trying to live a life where I'm focus on Christ and sometimes I'm distracted by my own desires sometimes I am distracted by my own needs and that's why fasting brings me back that's why this time of Rosh Hashanah the sounding of those trumpets 
becomes the alarm clock. And so I'm telling you, get on this fast. Get on the fast to kill your flesh, to sound the alarm, to look into yourself with the Holy Spirit. Am I in the Spirit? Am I where I should be? Do I have oil in my lamp? Am I on my way to becoming reprobate? Are my children ready? Am I making them idols and not telling them the truth? Am I like uh, somebody told me today, a parent created hell at the school. Am I covering for my children and not telling them the truth? This is a time for the alarm to sound. This is the time for the alarm. The alarm sounds just before that hour when it's time to go where you need to go, right? You set a five-minute countdown or whatever. This alarm is saying any minute Christ will burst the eastern sky. Any minute he'll come. Are you ready? Are your children ready? Are your family ready? Are you living in, in that attitude, I'll do what I want. I'm grown. Are you living in that attitude with bitterness in your heart towards somebody who has hurt you horrendously? God's going to fix that. But you need to fix you with God and keep that bitterness out of your heart. Bitterness defiles many Bitterness is one of the enemy's nastiest tools, like fear is. So I want to implore you, plead with you, encourage you, get your heart right with the Lord. Don't just say, I'm a Christian. What is it to be a Christian? What is it to follow Christ? How are you showing that you are following Christ? Is it just by word? Like he said, these people worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. God bless you. May you hear the truth and run with it. May you hear the truth. Listen, I don't want grandbabies and cousins and aunties. I'm crying out for them every day. I call the family, the Castellos, the Leacocks, the Atkins. I call the Cummins. I call call the Spellings. I call, I mean, I'm calling them, the Thomases. I'm calling the Bulgers, the McCullins. I'm calling the Reeves, the Deans, the Presses. I'm calling them before the Lord. The Arzolas, I'm calling them. I'm calling them out. The Wilsons, I'm calling them out. Every day I'm crying out, God, help us to be ready. Help us to be ready. But more than just ready, help us to desire a crown so we can throw it at your feet. And so let us do that which you desire us to do so we can get that crown to throw at your feet. I'm crying out. The Simons, I'm crying out. And I'm calling them individually by names. I'm crying out. God help us. The children that I teach, I'm crying out. Help us, Lord. Help us. I love you. God bless you, Cynthia. It's good to see you. Lydia, it's good to see you. Don't delay your prayers. Wake up. Pray, but pray according to the word. Open if you have to open the Psalms. Whatever. Pray the word. Amen. I love you, and I'll talk with you part three next Thursday. Should he say the same, I'll talk with you Sunday. And remember... This is a time when the witches are busy. You get busy. Don't let them enter into your lives. And don't be like them.
I love you. Be blessed and be encouraged. I love you much, much, much.